Okay, I think we're going to get things going. We see my attendees numbers have seemed to uh, reached a nice plateau. So again, welcome and thank you all for being here for tonight's event. Uh, while these online mediated experiences are certainly not ideal, it may in fact be working in our favor tonight. If you are joining us from Ontario, given the icy weather crackling across the province right now. So uh, silver linings, right? Um, before acknowledging our guests for this evening and getting things going, I would like to acknowledge that the Kitchener Waterloo Art Gallery is situated on the traditional territory of the Attawandron, Neutral, Anishinaabeg, and Haudenosaunee peoples. The Haldeman Tract is a large parcel of land extending 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River uh, that was promised to the Six Nations for their role in the American Revolutionary War. On behalf of my colleagues at the gallery, I want to express gratitude for the opportunity to do our work here, acknowledging the fact that we are guests on this land. We recognize our responsibility to learn to share its history, to respond and uphold the treaties made with Indigenous nations, and respect the right to land and life on unceded territories. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce Militin Gubash. Militin is one of five artists featured in the recently opened exhibition at the Far Edge of Worlds, curated by Jana Kozamora. If after this evening you are keen to continue the discussion or to learn more about the exhibition, I invite you to join the Walk the Talk curator tour led by Jana. This free event is at KWAG next Saturday, February 26th from 1 to 2 p.m. KWAG Artist Talks are generously sponsored by Momentum Developments and Sorbera Law. I would also like to acknowledge the ongoing support of the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council, the City of Kitchener, and the City of Waterloo. On a technical note, as uh, some of you have already discovered, the chat and Q&A features are enabled for this evening. If you're having any issues during the screening, please feel free to direct message myself or the host in the chat. Otherwise, please feel free to enter your questions uh, in either of the window throughout the event, and I will personally make a note of these as they come in and we'll make sure that they are addressed at the end. So please don't be shy. And last, but certainly not least, it is my pleasure to introduce Militin. Militin's multidisciplinary practice plays with narrative codes of video, sculpture and photography as much as performance. Gabash does not hesitate to alter a fact in order to make the underlying reality of his subjects and themes more credible, understandable, the artist extends the issues of memory by deploying a set of family stories that constantly intertwines facts and fiction, past and present, idealization and historical acuity, building over time a real, serious and incredible saga. Having immigrated to Canada as a young child, Gabash has continued to build a relationship with his native country through his parents' stories of their life in Serbia, intensive research and his own imaginings to fill in the gaps. With humor and intelligence, the artist addresses ideas of authenticity and perceptions of cultural, political, and social identities. He highlights the contradictions of our capacity to construct a sense of identity, whether it is through his large-scale black and white photographs of monuments to communists, uh, communism, sorry, as seen in the current exhibition at KWAG, his lands, uh, sorry, or through the episodes of the DIY sitcom soap opera reality show, Born Rich, Getting Poor, which predicted by a couple of years, our current selfie-driven culture of continuously updated autobiographical constructions, and which is also currently on view in KWAG's touring exhibition, I'll Be Your Mirror, which is at the Thames Art Gallery in Chatham right now. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Militin to the screen. Thanks, Darren, for that uh, great introduction. I did invent the selfie and you're welcome. So, uh, <laughs> uh, it's really my my great pleasure to to be here. Um, uh, Kitchener Waterloo Art Gallery has been um, very very important to me in terms of my own uh, professional development. Not the least reason for which is your magnificent uh, uh, director Shirley. Um, and so, being asked to do anything with Kitchener Waterloo Art Gallery, the answer is automatically a yes for me. So. Um, Okay, I've been asked to give some kind of an artist talk and, uh, and I will try to do so. Um, I'm a little bit rusty and I'm anyway, uh, super awkward and clunky and an anxious human being. And I'm doing it over Zoom on top of everything which uh, I'm not super familiar with. I use it sometimes, but uh, it's not an everyday thing for me and not a thing that I would think about doing 
an artist talk over. Still, anyway, I will try. Uh, so, um, how can I land you somehow in in my practice? Um, I've been turning this over in my head for a few days, and the nearest way that I can think think to do so is to um, is to tell you something about myself, uh, um, and that's. Uh, something, I guess, kind of biographical, but it is falsely biographical in a way because I don't really know all that much about myself. Um, I come from somewhere that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, I have very few recollections of any um, um, personal experiences with it. I came to Canada as a very small boy, not by my choice. I had no say in the matter um, and wound up somewhere that I had no idea where the hell I am, what the hell I'm doing. Uh, what I'm a part of or what I'm not a part of. I spoke not one word of English. Uh, I learned to speak uh, English by uh, watching television and imitating people that uh, are characters that I see on TV. And uh, I don't know if it's still absolutely readily accessible to you or not, but basically I am Bert from uh, Sesame Street. I kind of look like Bert. I kind of act like Bert. I've tried my best to hide my burtness, but uh, but I am. I burst into flames at the slightest provocation. I'm constantly annoyed by people around me. I don't understand what's going on. That's who I am. Um, even my name is um, uh, the story around my 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 name and the story of how uh, I and my family arrived in Canada is a kind of changeable story. Depends who you ask. Depends why they're telling you. Um, but uh, th those things are a kind of um, touchstone or a kind of foundation for who I think I am as an artist, what it is that I think that I'm trying to do. And so maybe I, before I, I go to show you some of my work, um, I tell you a little bit, bit about that. Um, my parents tried, uh, my parents saw the writing on the wall in Yugoslavia years and years and years before they actually managed to figure out a way to leave. Um, they would try to leave, something would screw up, it didn't work, it couldn't work, it was impossible. And so they would try to improve um, their situation somehow slightly. They would save up to buy a refrigerator, and uh, a year later they would have enough money to go buy a refrigerator, they go buy a refrigerator at the store, but the refrigerator doesn't work from the moment they plug it in. So they go back to the store, they ask the guy working in the store, uh, what they can do about this. He tells them, I don't know, buy another fridge. So, uh, so then they decide to buy a car and they save up to buy another, to, to buy a car. And um, because of the inflation rate uh, in Yugoslavia at that, that moment, late 1960s or so, um, the price of the car doubles overnight, literally the night before my father leaves from work to go buy a car. So they get fed up. They decide uh, the hell with a car. We won't have a car either. Um, let's go on a holiday. So they pick to go to Spain. Uh, now I'm born, I'm a little baby, um, but there's a huge outbreak of meningitis in Spain. And uh, on top of everything, uh, my parents decide to go um, on something like a honeymoon, on a, what they think is uh, supposed to be a, a seaside hotel called the Hotel Tito. And uh, they're assuming that it's called the Hotel Tito because of what um, some people might say is the dictatorial president of Yugoslavia, Marshal Tito. Um, but it turns out that the hotel is neither anywhere near the seaside. It's not really even a hotel. It's a farmhouse basically on, on farmland in the middle of nowhere. And, um, and the hotel's not even called uh, Tito for that reason. It's just named after another hotel. Um, somewhere else, like I guess in Italy or something. So my parents arrive, they're nowhere where they think they're supposed to be. They're nowhere near the sea. It's not really a hotel. Um, and uh, now they're stuck. So um, they decide to have dinner and the, the hoteliers uh, or really just farmhands feed them a chicken, but the chicken is uh, still half raw and my parents get sick, they get gastro. And uh, so they discover to their horror on top of being sick that there's no plumbing and uh, uh, no, no bathroom inside the hotel. There's just an outhouse somewhere in the field. Uh, there's no electricity, it's dark. And on top of everything, um, uh, somebody has decided to tie their donkey for the night to, to the, the 
outhouse's door. And so they have to, under these incredibly pressing time as a factor circumstances, wrestle with the donkey in the dark in the middle of the night to get uh, into, into where they need to go. That's still not the deal breaker. The deal breaker comes when a group of uh, drunken soldiers from a platoon that's stationed nearby arrive uh, at the hotel for the night and decide to pick on my parents, which um, might sound like like the setting for, for some kind of a sitcom, but I guess from how they told me the story is anything but, but funny, it was terrifying. And uh, they were hostile and kind of violent and uh, you know, asking them questions like, oh, I see you have a camera around your neck. Uh, there's a bridge nearby where you may be photographing your wife uh, near the bridge, which, you know, my father having served in the army would have known is uh, he's in danger right now. Um, photographing a bridge is a military installation. This could go very far wrong. This could, you could wind up in jail or worse if he says the wrong thing. And literally my parents in the middle of the night decide that's it. We've had it. We're going anywhere. We don't even care. They go home in the middle of the night, pack up their things, go to knock on friends' doors to tell them, which you couldn't tell them directly we're leaving. So they would say things like, uh, well, uh, we're going on a, on a trip. Uh, we're going on a trip. Want to maybe watch my apartment for a little while? Or do you want my, you know, do you want this thing? Do you want this projector? Uh, that kind of a thing. And they left and they left on the, on the idea that uh, they were going to go to Canada simply because my father had a pair of swim trunks with uh, a maple leaf on them. Somebody had sent him, perhaps his brother or something had sent him um, Canada maple leaf swim trunks. And so they decided literally to pack up their kids uh, and within a few days, get on an airplane, we came to Canada. Um, and, and it goes like that. Uh, it was a struggle. We were, um, desperately poor. We were, we were, I mean, so poor that poor people would hang out with us to feel better about themselves. And, uh, not a lot of progress was made. Me, I was a little kid. I spoke no English. I learned to speak English from watching TV. Uh, didn't know where I was, didn't understand what I was in. Somehow tried to put things together for myself. I felt very awkward and ashamed and uh, um, I had a, somehow really impressed upon me that I was really sort of second class. I, something was wrong with me. I speak with a heavy accent. I, uh, from somewhere far away, my name is unpronounceable. Anyway, I used to earn money as, as a little kid, like a lot of kids do, doing odd jobs, so shoveling sidewalks, mowing lawns, raking leaves, uh, running errands for people. And one of the people that I used to work for was a thousand-year-old Hungarian woman who lived uh, somewhere down the street from where I did. And uh, for a few years, uh, we had literally almost no interactions with each other. Um, she would just point at what she wanted me to do. I would try to do what I thought she was pointing at and then she would give me a few bucks and I'd go away. Um, except for one day when she decided to appear on her front steps, called me over, said, boy, come over here. Um, I did. She said, do you know what your name means in Hungarian? I said, no, why don't you tell me? But I knew that for um, a couple of hundred years, the place where I'm from was occupied by Hungarians. It touches the border with Hungary. Uh, just didn't seem like an entirely impertinent thing to be discussing with her. And uh, she told me, well, your, your last name, um, your last name means uh, in Hungarian, the guy who wears a shepherd's coat. So trying somehow to un understand like how I could integrate into the, the society and the culture that I now live in, I started to think, okay, well, I know that I'm named after my grandfather and I know that my grandfather uh, changed his name at some point. So my name is kind of a fake name. Um, my name really should be, uh, should my parents have still wished to name me after my grandfather, it should be Militan Petrovich. Uh, Petrovich is kind of like, um, I don't know, a, a Smith in, in English Canada or Tremblay in Quebec. Every second person is named Petrovich. If you throw your rock over a shoulder, you'll hit a Petrovich. Um, and my first name is a super nerdy name. So I'm something like you know, Harold Petrovich, <laughs> Harold Smith. Um, so I knew that, but I didn't know that my name is what this woman is now telling me it means. So I'm trying to relate it somehow uh, in my head as being something like Harold Shepard. Wow, that, cool. And so I must have been thinking this with my outside voice because she heard me 
And uh, she looked puzzled for a minute. I guess she kind of apprehended what I was driving at, laughed and said, oh, no, 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 no. We have a word in Hungarian for shepherd and it's nothing like gubash. Um, you're just the guy who wears his coat. So uh, every, sort of everything about me is some sort of a compounded mystery on top of a mystery. My name is legally my name, but it's not really supposed to be my name. I'm not really supposed to be here, uh, so on like that. <sighs> so um, there you go. Maybe at this point, um, it's a good place to jump in with um, sharing my screen and showing you some of my work. I'm, uh, uh, before I do that though, I might just mention I'm uh, 22 years a, um, a professional working artist, exhibiting, practicing, producing artist. 18 of those, those years I've done nothing uh, else to earn my generally kind of uh, modest living. Um, and I can root my earliest mature thought. I always knew that I wanted to be an artist. Um, there were some false starts in that for me. Uh, but, uh, I, I always knew I wanted to be an artist. I couldn't decide what kind of artist I wanted to be. Uh, I went, uh, via an academic uh, route in my educational training. Um, but I was a complete imposter of an ap academic. I had no interest in being an academic. I wanted to be an artist. I just couldn't decide what kind. And uh, I can root the earliest mature thoughts that I have about, um, had about, uh, being an artist and about, uh, uh, engaging in art, trying to produce art, trying to understand what kind of a dialogue I'm in, how I fit into that dialogue, uh, to about the time that I was 15, 16, 17 years old. It's still work that I'm willing to sign uh, my name to, and I will show you now the earliest example of that, which is here. Are you seeing this? Can somebody signal? I presume you're going to see this. So I'm just going to keep prattling on and uh, I think you're seeing it. This is uh, one example of um, maybe, hmm, I don't know what it was, four or five, something like that, uh, works that I, I um, engaged in. It was my first foray into photography, although I really wasn't that interested at that time in photography. I didn't have any kind of uh, sense or appreciation of its uh, of its history, its practitioners, its problematics, nothing like that. It was just an expedient way of somehow uh, somehow doing something that would leave a kind of trace of what I was doing. And since that time, so I'm 52, that's maybe, um, I don't know, probably around 16, 17 years old, something like that. So for about um, the first, four, my first foray into it was just sort of naively to use photography as a kind of recording medium to document a trace of something that would not be at some point uh, the case anymore. And uh, in all that time, in about a span of 35 years, I've gone in very different directions in photography and in other media, but as it pertains anyway to photography, um, I wake up every day with this um, uh, kind of sinking feeling that since that point, uh, that was probably the right way to think about photography and approach photography and this kind of um, documentary mode, documentary style, uh, that since that point, having diverged from that in, in some kinds of ways, I just made a terrible mistake. And I keep compounding the mistake by <laughs> going further and further <laughs> afield from that. And uh, at this point now, uh, because I'm closer to going into the ground than not, uh, all I can really hope to do is just make the problem so big that you won't see the edges and won't apprehend the problem. Um, and I have to talk myself out of that basically every day. I don't think that I've made that kind of horrible of a mistake really, but I wake up every day with that kind of nagging doubt. Anyway, what you were looking at is my first, uh, what I can root as my first mature um, forays into art making where um, I would um, stand next to uh, men that I thought could be somehow attracted to me and then ask passersby to, to take a picture of us uh, together. I did this kind of, I don't know, some number of, of times. I wouldn't have been able to tell you at that point that I thought that my um, work was uh, somehow rooted in some kind of performative actions. I knew a little bit of something about performance art. Um, I should mention, although I had to uh, now have uh, 
uh, three university degrees. I taught as a, a full-time university professor. At that point, I was actually a high school dropout. I, I dropped out of high school. I was a kind of difficult uh, problem teenager. Um, I worked in a factory and thought about art and every chance that, um, that I had, I would uh, sneak off to the um, University of Calgary's library. I grew up in Calgary um, after moving around a, a lot as a kid. We finally landed in Calgary. Um, I would go to the University of Cal Calgary's uh, library to the eighth floor, whereas uh, the art department, um, uh, art, art books, uh, sorry, uh, and they had great publications and I would try to learn about art. And so, um, so I could have told you something maybe at that time about um, performance art or performance artists. Uh, at that time, this is maybe the mid 1980s. Uh, I would have known about uh, Karen Finley and uh, I could have told you something about Vito Acconci or Marina Abramovich or so on, but I, I just had absolutely no uh, confidence that what I was doing was participating in anything that had to do with, I had no idea whether I was even making art. Uh, I just wanted to somehow. So my first forays into art are like that. Um, and it's useful for me, I think, to show you that because essentially what has happened if I just somehow focus on what has been my photographic practice um, over these years, I, I can somehow describe it as basically um, something like setting up a camera and then deciding which direction I want to turn it in. Is it away from me or is it towards me or is it to the people sort of standing next to me? And this changes from project to project, but it started like this, turning the camera somehow towards me, uh, which was then <laughs> A uh, little while later, uh, supplanted by trying, uh, endeavoring somehow to erase myself entirely out of the picture somehow, not, not only not appearing in the image, but somehow trying to erase um, my, my sensibilities uh, and um, my own, directly my own interests in photography. Um, as I started to, to, to um, study, and uh, gain a kind of a, an appreciation of photography that uh, I never really thought of before uh, or didn't, didn't have any apprehension of. I started to study uh, what was in the documentary tradition and try to poke holes in it somehow. So uh, some of my earliest uh, works, these, these are some examples of it, um, were that I would, I would try to find um, some kind of means by which to not really decide what it is that I'm going to photograph or how it is that I'm going to photograph, what it is that I'm going to photograph. So I would um, play with a Ouija board, for example, to tell me um, where to go, what to look for, um, uh, how to set my camera. Uh, it was somehow an attempt to try to reimagine what is photography actually you see here, uh, apparently what it is that I was supposed to find, I guess, was this snail crossing the sidewalk. Uh, so it was somehow trying to uh, operate within this documentary mode, but not in the way that I understood typically documentary style photographers, at least in an art context, uh, which is the one that I'm interested in, um, typically function some way in this reportage style, you load up your camera, charge your battery now, I guess, uh, you set off in a direction and you're either looking for a subject or, or uh, looking for um, a place where something is likely to happen. Um, so I, I try to eliminate myself entirely from anything like that uh, um, appearing in my work because of something that's unique to me or uh, that, that I'm interested in or uh, something like that. So, um, so I did this for some number of years. I started to show this work kind of early on. Um, I did it via different different uh, ways, throwing darts or a piece of paper on a map, uh, playing with a Ouija board. I always had this interest in the occult. Um, oops. My uh, grandmother was uh, presumably a witch, tried to teach me to see colors with my hands. Um, I don't really know what I think about all of that stuff, but it has appeared again and again as an element in my work. Um, I, I've assembled some, some different uh, works from different series for you tonight. Um, they're more or less in roughly some kind of chronological order, but uh, it's nothing like um, uh, 
uh, exhaustive of what is what is my my practice. So I just sort of picked some things that I think sort of show that idea of the camera or whatever is the device, the frame that I'm looking through, turning itself on me, turning itself away from me. Um, this is uh, uh, work that was made uh, in the very early 2000s. I'd already um, finished my MFA. I'd started to exhibit, uh, began to teach, um, this kind of thing. And uh, I was invited uh, rather early on uh, in, in my professional life as an artist to uh, do a web project for the Charles H. Scott Gallery that was um, in, that, that is in Vancouver. I guess it's not called the Charles H. Scott Gallery anymore, but it was uh, Emily Carr Institute of Art and Designs. Uh, it was some sort of initiative uh, by them to invite artists to create um, projects specifically for the web. It was called iProjects. And it was, um, I guess I was invited because of either the, something of the series that I, I uh, just showed you a few moments ago uh, and another early project entitled Plain Possum, which, uh, which had to do with uh, newspaper clippings that someone was anonymously sending me from Calgary long after I'd moved away, uh, that I was then somehow compelled to do something about. And I would periodically travel back to Calgary, somehow follow these stories, go to those sites, uh, try to do some kind of recreations of them. And uh, so I was invited probably on that basis um, to do this web project, but I somehow decided that I would do um, a web project with my parents and I for the first time uh, appearing uh, together in these series of uh, panoramic images that we would go to sites from um, a sort of subsection of these uh, newspaper stories that I was collecting that all turned out to be false. So they were stories that were reported in the news of these horrific events somewhere around the turn of the millennium, but they turned out not to have actually ever happened. Um, and the, the, the title of the project is Reenacting Tragedies While My Parents Look On. So I would, uh, I would somehow try to, uh, to uh, stage um, these events uh, within these sites where presumably they took place but didn't take place um, in and around Calgary, which is where I grew up, where my parents still lived. And uh, they were made as uh, these 360 degree panoramic images that uh, you would arrive at the website and kind of scroll across. They were these mysterious looking works uh, with these mysterious little actions with this goofy guy who uh, just appears to be playing dead, but is kind of playing dead like a two by four plays dead. And with what we presume are his parents who are either looking on or looking away. That's, uh, this image seems to notably demonstrate. Uh, and then you would visit the, the site. I, I won't call up the site. It's now on my website, but uh, I decided to show it to you this way. You would kind of enter one of two rooms. One room had these images that you would kind of click on and scroll across and uh, another kind of room that you would click on and scroll across these newspaper stories kind of functioned the same way as the images did. You would sort of see a section of it and then kind of move to the left or right to somehow put it together for yourself. Just to show you the last one, which happens to be a vertical. <clears throat> um, here we see, um, this is cutting much later uh, to a project entitled Flags, uh, in which probably not quite 10 years later, but something near 10 years later, uh, I was invited um, to, um, uh, to, to uh, do a, a residency and uh, create a work that would go into public uh, by an artist-run center uh, uh, in uh, Northern Quebec. And uh, I'd initially started um, a conversation with who was then the uh, artistic director and curator of that center. And we were talking about um, this idea of having some kind of a, a takeover of this uh, small touristic city called uh, Carleton-sur-Mer, Carleton-on-the-Sea, um, where I'd kind of take over the city somehow. And I, I started by this point to go back uh, to uh, Serbia with some kind of curiosity about uh, 
where I'd come from, uh, what was there for me, what I could understand about who I am and how this could play into my, my work as an artist. And uh, it was around those, those um, uh, early projects that I was doing like that, that, um, that this uh, director and curator came to visit me was looking at some of the things I was creating and we sort of came up with this idea um, based on, uh, it was kind of based for me on a film uh, called, uh, I think it was from the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s. I think it was called The Russians Are Coming, The Russians Are Coming. And it was this kind of imagining of um, a, a, a Soviet submarine that somehow ends up on the East Coast of, uh, of uh, the United States and it's like this kind of friendly takeover of, of, of this town by, uh, by the Soviets. And so sometimes we were talking and improvising some idea of a, a show. We sort of arrived at this idea of a group of, a group of Yugoslavians that would somehow end up uh, in Carleton Sir Mayor and somehow take over the city. Anyway, that project never happened. The director uh, was uh, uh, left his post, and uh, but the year after, um, nonetheless, the the uh, I was invited back to to do this exhibition that had this kind of um, idea of public uh, projects in the city involved in it. I'd been playing with um, with uh, the uh, Yugoslav flag, photographing through it, draping it over my head, taking pictures of the sun through it that I created. Um, that I created these kinds of, of, of flags, these sort of abstractions of flags that are really not about any particular nation. They're not, uh, they're made with the Yugoslavian flag, but in fact, they also have all of the elements that an Acadian flag has, which uh, which means something in Carleton sur Mer. So when I, when I came to Carleton sur Mer and talked to the mayor about what it is that I wanted to do and showed him an example of, of what I was doing, he was delighted. He said, well, firstly, I'll replace the Canadian flag. Next, I'll replace the, the Quebec flag. Maybe I'll replace the, the, the Acadian flag. Maybe I won't. Um, what you were seeing now is actually the site of the city hall in, in Carleton. It was supposed to be over the summer touristic uh, season months of um, uh, in Carleton. Apparently, they flew them for over a year and only took them down because the sun had faded them enough that they, they no longer looked like what they looked like. Jump again uh, a few years uh, ahead. I had done this series uh, of um, uh, ten-year solo survey exhibitions in a number of um, uh, museums, public galleries, university galleries, the like. Um, it started in two thousand and eight with um, uh, uh, two museum directors and curators coming to take uh, a program of video works. Uh, that uh, the Musée d'Art uh, Contemporain de Montréal was circulating, that they had organized like a five-year survey of my video works. They were offering them on tour. And um, a couple of curators, Shirley Medill uh, was one of them, came to the MAC thinking to take that, um, that touring video exhibition. Uh, we met and decided that we could do something much, much bigger and more ambitious. And so began this, this series of, of, of um, uh, collaborations with a number of institutions that would kind of join. And they decided to do their, each to do their own version of uh, my 10 years survey, what, what they thought 10 years of my practice uh, was about or what it meant. Uh, so it resulted in six different exhibitions. Um, some of the works obviously overlapped, but, um, but they were cast in different ways, framed in different ways. This is the last uh, of those survey exhibitions, uh, which is at the Fondry Darling in Montreal, where I had my studio for four years. I was in invited to be an artist in residence um, uh, there. And uh, the director wanted to do an exhibition with me. And I didn't want to leave and come back to do a show. So uh, I stayed on. I was only supposed to stay uh, two or three years, ended up staying a little over four. And uh, we, we would meet sort of from time to time. And we decided that she would be the curator of an exhibition that, of, of one of these survey exhibitions, but it, would, it came really from my initiative to want to do a survey exhibition that really in some sense surveyed and weighed um, all of 
my production, all of what it took um, to be an artist for 10 years. So um, when you enter, uh, I, I would say when you enter into um, art making, into, into that as a, a profession, uh, and you have a little bit of success that you want to, to build on, you quickly realize that you're in a kind of machinery that just wants to eat more and more of you. And you're obligated to constantly keep producing. You have to produce in order to show, you have to produce in order to get grants, you have to produce in order to sell. If you can sell a little bit, you just have to keep producing. And uh, because I was thinking about doing this exhibition somehow related to my studio there, and somehow to take the weight and the measure of what it meant to be an artist, it, it sort of became obvious to me at some point that I that I had to do a show that in one sense or another really took the full measure and the full weight of all of that kind of production to date. Because some of my work had already entered uh, into collections or was no longer accessible for some reason, I made um, these kinds of paper maquettes at the scale of works that I could no longer access. So, um, so there was that uh, mixed into the thing too. And uh, it was a very awkward space to show and it's, it's a very difficult, difficult space as you can maybe apprehend. And so, um, so somehow I kind of devised this idea of putting it all on pallets. Uh, I wasn't going to edit anything out. I wasn't going to put anything on the walls. I wasn't going to show anything the way that I would conventionally show a work. It was all just going to go there somehow to create a shape that you could walk in and out of, climb these stairs that were um, appearing every so often. You could kind of peer down, put things together for yourself like that. It's one of the shows that I'm most proud of, proud of doing to this, to this date. Um, <clears throat> here's another example of a work uh, that I was invited into an exhibition uh, to create something around the, the, the topic of, um, of uh, monuments. And uh, I created, I decided to create um, uh, a bronze plaque. Uh, as you can maybe read for yourself, uh, it, is, uh, it is an invisible monument that actually nonetheless has some stipulated dimensions and materials. And uh, it is dedicated to people who, uh, who somehow feel invisible. Uh, and uh, the, the trick in this is that the bronze isn't really um, um, bronze. It's actually uh, plastic that's made to look like bronze. It's still um, permanently installed there. Um, and if you turn your head away from the sign 180 degrees to where the monument is presumed to be, you, you look out onto a field that goes onto a little creek. Uh, so, uh, so um, sometime around uh, 2007, 2008, um, a few years after my father died, uh, a few years after I stopped teaching, um, I, I uh, started to um, become very curious about um, returning to where I was born and trying to figure out something about where I'm from maybe do some projects there, something like that. So I, I started to return um, to Navi Sad, where the city where I was born, travel a bit where I could and uh, gather some materials. It turns out I was sort of quickly invited into some exhibitions. I did an exhibition at one of the national museums. Um, and uh, I went um, not really knowing what I should look for and what I should find. Anyway, what I did discover was that um, that uh, Serbia is in a um, uh, very difficult transition from socialism to capitalism, the result of which uh, being that uh, I would visit uh, little towns outside of larger cities where perhaps I had a relative or something that I was looking for and discovered that there were vast tracts of, of people who have been um, left uh, uh, unemployed, uh, unemployable. They don't have electricity. They don't have heat. Um, it's, it's a very difficult thing to, to look at. People of my generation and the older generation are completely lost. Um, it doesn't look like it's going to go to the better. 
anyway, one night I took a walk around a neighborhood. I was in a, a little uh, factory town outside of Belgrade called Ponchevo, which is where um, one of my few uh, remaining living relatives lives, it's my aunt. I decided to take a walk um, outside at night. And uh, I would walk from one neighborhood to another, some of them having no electricity whatsoever. But I passed an, an, uh, a little apartment that had a light coming uh, through the window. And as I walked past, I decided to peer in. And I saw something I really wasn't expecting to see, but that spoke to me very much about um, stories that I grew up with and my family, the way that I grew up. Um, uh, we, we were economically uh, very challenged for a large part of uh, the time that I uh, uh, lived in Canada, lived with my parents. Um, but my parents were, were war children. They were very resourceful. So uh, they learned from the time that they were little children to, you know, make things out of other things. They would make uh, shoes out of cardboard to go to school, uh, make one pen out of five that don't work, that kind of thing. Uh, my mother's toaster would break. She was thrilled to think about buying a new one. My father would somehow fix it with the spring from a ballpoint pen or whatever. Anyway, I look uh, through this through this window, and uh, I saw this incredible sight, which was um, uh, a kind of chandelier that somebody had fashioned out of all kinds of things, bits and pieces of whatsoever fell to hand, copper tubing, tin cans, uh, I don't know what. All. I was astonished by this and it, it, I didn't know what to do with what I saw. I didn't even have any way to record what I'd, I'd seen. It Literally, I didn't know what to do with what I'd seen other than that I was very touched by it and it, it, it spoke to me somehow. It spoke to me about um, resilience and uh, the creative impulse. It talked to me about somehow being an artist and just trying to do something, anything with whatever is at hand. And um, this, this image stayed with me for a while, returned to Canada, returned to my studio, and the thought of this thing just didn't want to leave sufficiently enough that I started to want to try to do something about it. My first foray into it was just to um, commission having a kind of lamp made out of um, flea market materials um, created and, and sent to me in order to decorate a, a set of a video that I wanted uh, to shoot that was taking place in the Yugoslavia of the past. And as I had this, this, uh, these parts sent to me to fashion a lamp out of, I realized that the project could be much richer than that. And so I started regularly to, uh, to um, send uh, drawing plans of uh, lamp designs to a taxi driver of my acquaintance uh, in Serbia who would go to uh, the local flea markets to sort of hunt out objects and materials that somehow maybe had something to do with what he was seeing in, uh, in these drawings or what the, the flea market vendors felt they could do with, uh, with what they were looking at. Uh, interesting what, interestingly, what I discovered is that um, uh, uh, the flea markets and uh, even some shops in Serbia were um, basically all being run by uh, Chinese merchants coming with caravans and caravans of things um, that here, I guess we would find in Dollarama or places like that, uh, dollar stores. Um, so they're bringing these trucks. They spoke perfect Serbian, just enviably good Serbian. Um, and, uh, and then with some kinds of, you know, local vendors you would expect to to find at any flea market, people who just want to sell whatever it is that they they have to sell. So I started to get these parts back and uh, would somehow have to figure out how to as assemble them. And this resulted in a rather large series of these things, uh, which are just called lamps. Uh, for me, they're sculptures, but uh, they, they function to give you light and uh, to engage you and uh, interest you somehow. This is some uh, example of them. Sometimes the materials become really quirky. You're looking up at the lamp in this case. Um, I engaged in this project for some number of years as well. It really, for me, somehow, I never really address myself as an artist to uh, topics. I, I rarely um, uh, even start with anything that I could, I could uh, 
want to even describe as a plan. I sometimes don't even start with what I think I can re reasonably describe as a subject. I try to start from the idea of a situation where enough kinds of things that feel like they have something to do with me as an artist because they've appeared in my practice before or um, because it is something that I'm really interested in or something that I've experienced or uh, uh, something that I have the feeling that I could say something towards um, this when there's enough of those kinds of convergences, it starts to feel like it's really my work and uh, enough for me to get involved in. And this was one of those instances where I felt that it was talking to me about resourcefulness. It was talking to me about wanting something so badly that you will make it no matter what out of whatever you find at hand. It was talking to me somehow about the way that capitalism and globalism really work on the ground. It was talking to me about going to look for authentically for a culture that uh, I think I somehow belong to, but have, am not a part of anymore or have lost and not being able to find it, but finding something else. It had those kinds of kinds of crossovers overs for me. And so uh, I felt like something that I should do something about. And so I did here, you see an installation view of it in a commercial gallery that um, uh, one kind of idea of a constellation of these things. Here's another one where they, they hung for a number of years at uh, in a uh, contemporary art museum, uh, the Mac uh, Laurentide, uh, about a half hour north of uh, Montreal in uh, St. Jerome. They've now entered a, a permanent collection. You know, I'm going to just plow through the next set of images. I, I see that, um, that we're kind of getting to the point where we're Maybe I should stop talking and uh, let somebody else pose a question. I will just show you this. Uh, finally, it is um, uh, uh, perhaps my most uh, ambitious installation uh, to date. It is entitled The Magician's Hand in the Cold Light of Day. It was exhibited as the fi uh, final third of a series of three um, museum exhibitions that I was invited to do with the Mac Laurentide. In St. Jerome. They asked me to do a small, medium, and large exhibition over the span of uh, three years. Um, I was skeptical but agreed. I could finally I saw what was their wisdom in that with uh, having a sustained engagement with the public um, over a period of time. This is the, the uh, 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 third and uh, large uh, uh, exhibition. Um, and it's the starting point for me was wanting to somehow think about photography without actually doing photography. I wanted to think about photography from the point of view of engaging in sculpture that somehow had something to say or to do with photography. It started with that, and it started with um, a glass magic lantern slide that I had bought from a photo dealer that you can see in the left hand of the image. It is a gruesome image that has been highly doctored nonetheless from uh, 1914. It's presumably dated at 1914. It is an image that purports to be of a village of uh, massacred uh, uh, Serbian uh, men, women, and children uh, that was apparently used, um, uh, pu published, and uh, circulated almost exclusively in North America and Canada and the United States to solicit the engagement of Canada and the United States in the First World War. So it was used kind of like a propagandistic um, image. So I had this glass magic slide. I had um, this I desire to do something about um, photography, but not in photography. And otherwise I had the, the um, interest to do something with the uh, imagery that I cannot to this day get somehow out of my head of um, the civil war in Yugoslavia in um, uh, the 1990s. That, that uh, not perhaps so directly, but somehow to, to touch that. And so, um, so I created this kind of scene, this scenario that is both um, a kind of disaster zone and a kind of dis set of a disaster zone, if you will, uh, comprised of um, sculptures that I'd been making for uh, some number of years and all of my studio apparatus that goes around it, tripods, lights, light stands, backdrops, uh, 
various other kinds of uh, tools and equipment, uh, photographic cameras, cameras that I made, cameras that my father and I made that at one time I used, but that now had sort of more of a sculptural purpose, and that it would all somehow be generated um, by um, this motorcycle that would run somewhere in, in one of the museum galleries. When I was invited to do these exhibitions, uh, I thought, uh, okay, um, I'm, I want to somehow, uh, you want me to do three, I would really only do one. But uh, if I'm going to do three, then I'm going to do things because the museum is somehow off a bit off of the track that is obvious to go look for contemporary art in. And uh, because they're kind of super great with me and uh, uh, super generous and willing to entertain every harebrained idea that I come up with, I would sort of pose them these problems like, okay, you want to do a fourth thing with me, we're going to do a play. And in fact, we did. Uh, you want to do this third thing with me, I want to run a motorcycle in the middle of the gallery because I wanted to somehow um, somehow touch upon in, in, in some way um, uh, how wasteful and resourceful the industry that I actually work in is, which even when very often when, when uh, uh, artists try to um, somehow talk about uh, environmental issues in their work, what is really hidden is all the things, all the, the, the things around how that work actually comes to be on a wall lit in, in a gallery or museum space. You know, work has to be, uh, first of all, created in many ways, that's a wasteful um, uh, enterprise. It has to be wrapped and crated. That's a wasteful enterprise. It comes then onto a truck that drives it across the city or across the country. It gets onto an airplane or a ship. It crosses the seas. Uh, again, there's another truck waiting for it, so on and so on, right? We, we never really look at that stuff. We never really implicate ourselves, I feel, or not very often in that apparatus. I wanted to implicate myself in this by creating and running this sort of dirty machine that would create somehow the electricity that would run the show and kind of did. Um, you can see some kinds of, uh, some views of this, including things like this, which is um, a kind of fantasy camera. I, um, my father and I used to make uh, really specialized um, cameras for me to use in the absence of being able to afford them. We would kind of, I, me or he and I would, would make them. And this was a camera that I started to make in order to peer into my grandfather's crypt uh, to see whether there was something still in it. Apparently my grandfather had bought um, uh, a, a cemetery plot in Navi Sad uh, where we could all be buried. But um, after he died, payments stopped being made and his headstone disappeared. And uh, I was curious <laughs> to know whether there was something still inside of that crypt. And so I made this camera that preposterously can't work as a camera. Light doesn't work that way. Optics don't work this way, but somehow it ended up being kind of fantasy camera. So you see this kind of um, uh, event that could be kind of gruesome, could be kind of tragic, but that is all taking place in and amongst um, st studio apparatus, um, a backlog of all of my work that's now be been created as a kind of funerary pyre that's about to be set on fire. And um, there's a play of light and shadows. It's like a, like a kind of theater piece. And uh, geez, I could keep going on, but it's basically about eight o'clock. Should I just, shall I stop here and uh, we let the audience pose some questions? Uh, I think so. I think uh, that sounds good to me. Thank you so much for bringing us through uh, so much work and so many years. Uh, I learned a lot and uh, really enjoyed uh, the stories that you shared with us, although I, I should apologize to the great many heralds in our audience this evening. Oh, yeah, I'm so, I, I Yeah, I, I, that I was totally I, inappropriate. That was totally uh, inappropriate, man. I was so <laughs> um, so uh, once again, if you do have any questions, um, feel free to put those into the chat uh, or into the Q&A box, and uh, we will get to those um, in time here. But perhaps uh, just to get the ball rolling, uh, Militon, my first question um, is about a lifelong process of growing up. And I think in our youth, you know, so much of who we become 
is ultimately shaped by the people and the places around us. And these may be our parents, our friends and other familiars. Uh, and in part, I think we learn about the kind of person that we want to be or to become uh, by watching and experiencing the actions of others. And I think this came up in, in a number of your stories as well. Sure. Um, I'm curious, what surprising things have you learned about yourself or your, or your family, specifically through this process of collaborative creation with them? Oh, geez, what a great question. Uh, hmm. What did I learn? Well, um, I learned that uh, I, I've learned that I'm not who I think I am. Uh, I uh, have learned that uh, my parents aren't who I think they are. I've learned that uh, my partner's not who I think she may be. Uh, I've, and I, um, that that could sound like <laughs> like it's uh, like it's uh, a problem or, or troubling, but um, in fact that. Uh, something about maybe what I've learned about that is that we're not essentially anything. Um, we are an aggregate of all sorts of things that we, uh, we don't want to be, that we want to be and try to be, uh, that we try to be, but kind of somehow uh, fail or get misdirected at, uh, that there's no essential self. I mean, when I look inside myself, um, uh, I don't know, maybe this is a problem. I should be talking to a, prof a professional, <laughs> but, uh, but I don't see anything that's essential in myself. My name's not really my name. I'm not really who I think I am. I don't see myself the way that other people see me. Um, I don't know really how I see myself. I play a character of version of myself in some of my work. You mentioned born rich, getting poor. It's probably the most pronounced example of that. Um, uh, that would be a kind of good example of, of what I mean. I would ask myself, um, like it's somehow made uh, in in between being scripted and improvised. Uh, but in either event, um, in order to be in it, I would have to ask myself, first of all, myself, who do I think I am? What do I think that I'm like? And um, I can't really decide even to this day how much of it I made up because I think that it could be funnier or more engaging or somehow um, uh, tell you something more insightful by pretending that I'm something that I'm not or pretending to be someone that probably I'm not really quite like that, but I can't really decide what that is when I really ask myself, uh, and it, because I worked on this project for um, several years, um, I started to have this um, kind of eerie feeling whenever I would respond to something, whenever I would have a reaction to something, um, am I reacting this way because really intrinsically me who is me would react this way or am I reacting this way because I can't get out of character somehow? Like, like I'm that much of a method actor that I can't, you know, <laughs> I can't get out of my character. I can't sleep. I can't function unless I'm my character and I can't decide what that is. Uh, I'll give you another, just a really quickly, another example. Um, uh, I was filming something once with my mother, uh, my mother, unlike some of the other people who participated in inborn rich getting poorer, um, uh, needed really precise scripting. She needed to know exactly what she's saying, why, uh, uh, so forth. So I wrote this, um, some dialogue for her for this particular scene where uh, reliably I screwed something up. I had the bad reaction, everything's fucked up now. And uh, I needed someone to be critical of what I'm doing in this, uh, in this scene. So I wrote, I wrote the, um, I wrote the dialogue that I thought was kind of appropriate both to the situation and both what my mother being critical of me could say. And she read this since the first time she objected to something that I asked her to do. She said, I, I don't want to say this. I said, okay, why? She said, because I would never say this to you. Your father would say this to you. You want me to be your father in this case. So maybe it was me who made this kind of uh, confusion. Uh, maybe it's her who is not apprehending <laughs> what she can really be like. Maybe it is uh, uh, something else that I'm not uh, right now uh, anticipating to say. But anyway, yeah, sort of in summary, I would say that, uh, that there's no essential to who we think we are. Oh. Right, right. I, th I think, uh, you know, your, your work and, and its inclusion, uh, the work that Jana selected for uh, At the Far Edge of Worlds mm -hmm. um, is really great and works, works on a, a number of different levels for me. And I, I think about some of the questions that Jana asked about what it means to be uh, in between and uh, in an intermediary position, right. um, somewhere where you're, uh, you're on, in some ways uncertain terrain, but a, a terrain that's sort of pregnant with this promise of what you can 
uh, will it to be, uh, what you want it to be, and maybe picking up on some of the story you were just sharing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that while so many of your works investigate self and personal relations, familial relations, there is also the sustained study of what it means to be a nation, to have a nation, to lose a nation. Uh, and I'm curious, how has your personal relationship to nationalism changed over the years as the country that you were born uh, into ceased to be found on a map and as your time in Canada has been sustained? Right. Well, how can I say this? Um, uh, it's restless and, and difficult to put a, a finger on or a, a precise shape to. Um, uh, uh, in Canada, I'm looked at like I'm not Canadian somehow or haven't been. Uh, on top of the matter, I live in Quebec where I'm distinctively not Quebecois. Um, I'm sort of two steps removed outside of the culture that I was born in and think that I'm somehow a part of. On the other hand, when I travel back to where I think that I, I come from, they introduce me as a Canadian artist. They, I'm, Serbian is my first language. I, I think I speak passably well anyway. If maybe I have some kind of an accent I don't detect or I talk in a way that's apparently really from the neighborhood where, uh, where I grew up, but, uh, but uh, people will switch immediately to English uh, with me. So not uh, that either. So somehow I'm, 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 perpetually doomed to be uh to be some, somehow displaced out of place out of the frame of reference looking in um i mean it just feels like like me I, it doesn't change day by day so so uh so, so yeah i mean you know i don't really wake up in the morning and ask myself who am i today where am i uh, from today, something mm -hmm. like that, but but certainly, yeah, it's evolved. I mean, it's evolved in ways that that uh, you know, I'm not especially proud to say that uh, that when I go to where I come from, I'm ashamed of certain things that I see. I'm, 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 I'm I feel terrible to see people struggling. I feel ashamed of some of the things that I hear coming out of people's mouths. Uh, at times, I'm proud of other things. Uh, mm -hmm. It, it's, it, there's sort of no way to really characterize it one way. Um, so I'm, I'm I, I, that's kind of the best that I can do sort of off the top of my head, but. Yeah, yeah. So the, uh, and the, you know, the question for me came up, I guess, so much has been going on. I mean, so much is always going on, but it seems like it's been especially pronounced over the last couple of years. And um, even as somebody that was born here and grew up here and doesn't have that lived experience of the things that you're talking about, um, even recently, you know, I'm having these these questions as well of, uh, you know, I feel the same way of like, there's things that I'm ashamed of, of this nation and what it purports to be, uh, and things that I'm proud of and things I wish it would do and things it never will do. And um, so it's interesting to see how that comes out through your work and, and how you're able to sort of tackle those really big questions. Right. Um, okay. We do have we do have a question from the audience. We do. Uh, Shirley has a question for you. Okay. Um, she asked, the lamps are really intriguing to me, given your work in performance and photography and the sculptural component. They do reflect a character of an Eastern European sensibility, maybe <laughs> my personal take, and also a humanistic form in a way. Was that a bit intentional or am I imagining that? Well, you're definitely not imagining it. Uh, it's, I mean, it's intentional to the extent that it can be in, uh, intentional for me. I mean, some of the things come to me, I didn't, you know, I don't pick everything that, that goes into it, but I do supplement it in certain ways. And of course, there's a decision-making process that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that takes place and that it is me who is the author of them. Finally, it's me who assembles them. It's me who decides how they go together. It's me who runs to the value village or flea market or whatever, because this just won't go together somehow. And I have to, I, I want to resolve it. Um, so, some are really actually figurative. Is that, did I apprehend this correctly? It was, it was surely asking me that there's, there's a kind of anthropomorphic or, uh, or uh, yeah, of course. I mean, some are actually figurative. Maybe they didn't appear in the, the ones that I selected, but actually um, uh, representations of human heads appear or animals or uh, whatsoever. And some of them I've, I've made kind of like about 50 of them to date. So certainly looks like a, one looks like a giant squid. You kind of want to hug it. Um, you know, others 
have again they have heads so they're kind of obviously they're they're somehow personifications of, uh, of what could be individuals definitely all right thank you i um i think there's a just a comment there in the chat i think you can see that as well ernest dateweiler uh just thanking you for your honest and approachable uh predisposition in the talk this evening which uh, i definitely can echo that sentiment um i have uh perhaps one one last question for you just to send us off into the evening um and take us up to the present i suppose um where do you find your work taking you these days and have you felt any impact or shift from the ongoing uh global circumstances that we are finding our way through Mm -hmm. uh, okay, well, uh, sort of in no particular order, um, I just moved my studio, uh, st start to reopen it um, in a new building. Uh, this has been the past uh, mm -hmm. month and a half. Uh, during the, uh, so that the uh, magician's hands in the cold light of day, that final large installation that I showed you, that opened a couple of weeks before the first uh, lockdowns. In, of, uh, of COVID in, in Quebec. Um, and uh, so it opened, closed, opened, closed, opened, closed, uh, sort of a series of times. Um, and all of that was taking place in some rather large uh, uh, shifts in my own life. And uh, I, um, I, I started to talk with um, uh, a very large, uh, uh, very important um, collector of those kinds of work, multimedia works uh, in, in Quebec. He's kind of the reference for these things. He sort of does what museums presumably are supposed to do, but don't really do anyway for people like me. Um, and uh, this, this conversation went on for well over a year. And... Um, the, the show opened, show closed, show open, show closed, show open, cl closed. Finally, it all came back to my little studio where uh, I didn't really know what to do. I was uh, uh, kind of confronted to the fact that uh, I don't know how long this is going to go on. I can't root all of my professional problems and just the fact that we are now in COVID and in lockdowns, I'm already in that kind of long gray stretch of highway that is uh, being a middle-aged artist, right? I'm not young enough to be sexy for anyone, not old enough to be imperative to show before I fall into a hole in the ground. And, uh, you know, it's just kind of a struggle. I'm not really taking any boxes for anyone at the moment. That's fine. But the day in, day out reality for me is just kind of understanding that I have to find it in myself to somehow rediscover what it is that made me want to be an artist in the first place because God knows it's not the money or, uh, you know, uh, the, the trappings of celebrity that come with, uh, with it. That's not touching me in any way. Um, so I was really struggling with this thing, even to the point, I'm sorry, it's a little bit anecdotal, but uh, one day as I'm walking back from my studio, we have 8 p.m. curfews. Um, I'm walking back, it's light is starting to go. I'm in my head, I'm thinking about how some turns in my life have happened and uh, I'm not sure how I feel about them. And I stop at this intersection uh, to wait for the light to change and uh, a city bus comes roaring past me with those you know mirrors that stick out 20 feet in either direction. And literally, I feel like I could feel it graze the tip of my nose. And I'm already somebody who's kind of, like, I always kind of appear to be slightly drunk, even though I never am. I kind of don't have good balance. And uh, it just occurred to me that I, if I'd slightly kind of moved ahead, uh, this thing would have taken my, my, my entire head off. And I burst into tears. I was hysterical. I couldn't uh, deal with myself anymore. And I had kind of one of those reckoning moments of like, if something were to happen to me, let alone what does my life even amount to, but what will what will happen to all of this stuff that like I'm now sort of somehow trying to reinstall, do other things with in in in, in my studio, uh, and uh, and I just kind of had this moment where I thought, okay, um, factually, I'm kind of closer to the end of my life than I am to the beginning of my life. I'm kind of biologically programmed to live maybe another 10, 15, the best 20 years. Um, what do I really want to do with myself? There are certain changes that are happening in my life that are, that are 
asking me to somehow pay attention to them. I can't just keep going on like this. We're in a circumstance where we don't know what will return to normal, what will be normal anyway, what's normal for me. Um, and, uh, and I decided that I would, um, I would give myself after this project, the next two projects to really decide. I, there's two projects that I really want to resolve. And beyond that, I don't even really know. Uh, anyway, to, to, to wrap up the story, the collector came and bought the entire installation. It's the biggest single sale I've ever made. Uh, the, 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 the biggest uh, installation I've ever made, what's more. And now I've given myself two projects to, to resolve. And beyond that, then I guess I have to, I, I'm asking myself to ask myself what it is that I want to do beyond that. Regularly, I kind of return to um, earlier works. I have no feeling that I've ever really finished anything. I've just resolved it to the state where I can exhibit it or where it goes into a collection. And now presumably I'm no longer allowed to touch it because you know, uh, collections curators are super mad when you do that. Uh, it screws everything up. But um, but for me, I have no compunction to revisit something, re-edit it, recreate it, uh, put it next to something else whatsoever. So I do some sort of projects where I look back at my own production over 30 something years and recreate some of those projects. But there's two big projects that I'm working on. There are two installations. Um, one is to create a kind of machine that, I'm saying machine, but it's in heavy quotes, that transforms unlovable objects into lovable ones. And uh, the other one is uh, to create a kind of image processing machine um, that allows me to see things that either I'm not supposed to see or someone or something that I can't see anymore. That sort of loosely, that's what I can tell you about it. Okay. Um, and <laughs> If you've seen, you know, the kinds of things that I make in, in the, the installation that I showed you, you can imagine that it's kind of made with everything but what an image processor might be made with, kind of made with cookie jars, but uh, but uh, not really cookie jars, but something like it. Um, so All right, great. I can tell you with that. <laughs> uh, a few things to look forward to. Sure. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, for sharing, for being here with us tonight, for uh, the depth of the work that you've showed and the stories that you've told along the way. I have felt very fortunate to be able to visit with your work every day when I go into work now uh, at the gallery in Kitchener Waterloo and um, to see the works on the walls and just think about, uh, about the stories that you've told us and about the exhibition, exhibition that Jean has pulled together. Um, it's given me a lot to think about, and I hope that, um, that others take the opportunity to come uh, visit the show while it's still up. It's up until uh, May 29th, um, but best not wait that long, right? Come back, come back a few times, right? So, um, but thank you so much, Militant, and uh, thank you, everybody, for spending your evening with us, everybody that's there in the chat. Um, it's been great, and uh, just thank you so much. Thanks to you all. Thank you everyone for coming. Right. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night.